Hey there, welcome back to another episode of Total Recall, a look back at the films of the year 1990. Now, before I get into starting off where I stopped in the last installment, I want to talk about Bird on a Wire, a film that I discussed briefly but didn't really talk about that much because I hadn't seen it yet. I checked this out for the first time recently and I really enjoyed it. Mel Gibson and Goldie Hawn are the perfect pair. They have excellent chemistry. You can tell that they're having a blast working on this film and working together and as a result it's a very entertaining movie. And on top of that, it's got some really exciting, thrilling action sequences and set pieces dir directed by John Badham. And despite the PG-13 rating, it's got an edge to it. These action scenes definitely have a certain bite to them. I mean, there's a guy who ends up getting killed by piranhas. There's another guy who gets electrocuted. A bunch of people get shot. And there's a, I think there's even an F-bomb that's dropped. It doesn't feel like your typical PG-13 film, especially nowadays if you look at a PG-13 action movie. This feels like it's as close to an R rating as you can get without actually being rated R. It's early 90s PG-13, so you can tell that they're able to get away with more than you see nowadays in terms of what the MPA would allow. I mean... Yeah, Mel Gibson, Goldie Hawn are great. David Carradine and Bill Duke play some good foils for those two. And it goes by at a lightning quick pace. And it features a really underrated score by Hans Zimmer. And overall, I, I highly enjoyed this movie. You'll probably hear me talk about this one even more in depth uh, in the near future. Because uh, I, I think this deserves uh, a lot more recognition. And definitely a Blu-ray. I don't know why this is not on Blu-ray in the US. This movie made a ton of money. And it has a pretty decent fan base among people who have seen it. Uh, when you look at the critical reception, it's mixed, but when you look at the fan reception, it's got a really high fan reception, and I can totally see why. It's a really fun film. So that's Bird on a Wire. The next film is Cadence, which is directed by Martin Sheen. For some reason, this poster calls it Stockade. I guess that's what it was called in Canada. Cadence is a much better title. I haven't seen this one yet. Uh, I've seen the trailer for it. It looks promising. You got Charlie Sheen, who plays this uh, soldier who's thrown into this stockade, which is full of black inmates. Instead of really not handling it well and falling victim to racial hatred, he becomes friends with them and he rises up against the prison warden who's played by his father, Martin Sheen. And you also have Lawrence Fishburne in an early role. You got Blue Mankuma, Michael Beach, James Marshall, uh, Lachlan, Lachlan Monroe is also in it. Uh, you might recognize him from a various string of, of different movies. And uh, I can't really rate it or say that much because I haven't seen it yet, but it's a film that I am curious about watching one of these days and I believe I do have it on VHS I don't think I have the DVD I might I know the DVD is crazy expensive nowadays because it's been out of print for a long time but yeah it's one that I am definitely going to check out one of these days maybe if I do a, a Charlie Sheen marathon or something like that that would be a fun marathon to do actually because he's actually got a pretty wide array of different kind of films that he's done throughout his career so that's cadence the next one is cadillac man directed by roger donaldson starring robin williams and tim robbins as well as actors and actresses like laurie petty fran drescher judith hoag from the 1990 teenage mutant ninja turtles film or annabella sciora this is another one I haven't seen. I've seen the trailer for it. Just like Cadence looks promising. This looks like it could be a fun, witty movie. I just haven't gotten around to checking it out yet. Uh, 
deals with Joe, a car salesman played by Robin Williams, who has two days to sell a certain number of cars or he loses his job. And then he's got to deal with all this other crazy stuff like these girlfriends who are bringing all this drama and he's got this missing teenage daughter and then you have Tim Robbins's character who's a criminal who decides to take Robin Williams for hostage he takes him hostage and there's this hostage situation at the car dealership so now he's got to deal with that and it just looks like a promising fun little movie I just haven't had the opportunity to check it out yet but uh I'll definitely uh, give it a shot one of these days. So that's Cadillac Man. The next one is the 1990 Captain America film directed by Albert Payune. This is one that... <laughs> I gotta be honest. I have a soft spot for this film because I grew up with it on VHS. I am a huge fan of Captain America, the comic book character. One of my favorite comic book characters is Cap. I love Captain America, and for many years, this was the closest that any Captain America fan got to a somewhat loyal or respectful adaptation of the character. Because what we had previously was the 70s made-for-TV film starring Reb Brown with his plastic shield and his crash helmet, and... Those were an embarrassment. They weren't anything remotely close to what Cap was about. And this came closer. And, and I think that's something that is lost in a lot of people nowadays because they did not really have the same experience. They either didn't know that much about this movie or they saw it after they already saw the first Avenger or Winter Soldier. And... For many years, I tried to be soft on it, not as hard, because of the soft spot that I did have for it in my heart. And I revisited it uh, a few months ago, and it is aged like milk. This film sucks. It's not a good movie. The action is lackluster. Matt Salinger has no screen presence. He's horribly miscast. I don't know what they were thinking. Just because he's the son of J.D. Salinger, the offer, that doesn't mean he's a movie star. Uh, the costume looked fine, despite the rubber ears. And there are some moments of fun, like the scenes when he throws the shield. But the Captain Carjacker shit, Italian Red Skull, the Environmental Protection Agency preachy message at the end when the film just stops and there's a picture of Captain America from the comics and a text scroll uh, text that ends up crawling down across the screen talking about the environment and you're just like what the fuck is this I really would have loved to have seen what this film could have been if it did star Michael Dudikoff which was originally one of the plans that they had because at least Michael Dudikoff has a screen presence and he can fight why wasn't he cast? He's got blonde hair. He was the American fucking ninja. Why the hell did they pass on Michael Dudikoff? I do not understand. It's not like he was doing that much in 1990 or 1989 when they did this movie. And I think he might have actually done it. But um, instead we got Matt Salinger and his rubber ears. Scott Pollan tries as a Red Skull, but he just is it doesn't have a good script to work with. Uh, Ned Beatty wasted, so is Darren McGavin and Michael Nori, as well as Melinda Dillon, who's just barely even in the movie, along with most of the cast. Ronnie Cox as the president, one of his weakest performances and one of his weakest roles. Just a really lame movie. Uh, and it didn't help either that Captain America was a total pussy. Gets his ass kicked repeatedly. Uh, the Red Skull makes short work of him early on in the movie, and then later on in the film. Is this one of those things where it's like, this is a superhero? It's more like a super flop or, or a super wimp. The super soldier serum didn't make this guy super at all. But anyway, uh... Yeah, th this is this is not 
uh, held up uh, over the years. So that's Captain America. Then we have Catch Fire. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, another 1990 film directed by Dennis Hopper. Now, this is one of those films that I'm curious about because you got Dennis Hopper who directed it. And look at this cast. Jodie Foster, Dean Stockwell, Vincent Price, John Turturro, Fred Ward, Charlie Sheen, Joe Pesci, Catherine Keener. I mean, this is a really big cast. Bob Dylan also has a bit role in it. And it deals with a witness played by Jodie Foster who saw something she shouldn't have. She gets put into witness protection, but she can't seem to stay one step ahead of the mob's chief killer, played by Dennis Hopper, I believe. Uh, I have this film on VHS or DVD, but I haven't gotten around to seeing it yet. But uh, it looks interesting. Simple plot, but the cast alone, I mean, it's a crazy cast. You even have someone like Tony Basil's also in it, or Alex Cox. So yeah, uh, that's Catch Fire. The next one that we have here is Chicago Joe and the Showgirl, directed by Bernard Rose, who directed Candyman and Paper House. This stars Kiefer Sutherland, Patsy Kensett, Emily Lloyd, this deals with a American serviceman who is either stationed in London or, or is living there, and he decides to impress his girlfriend in England by acting like he's some American gangster, but then things become too real or something along those lines. I've never seen the film, but I like Kiefer Sutherland. Bernard Rose is a good director, and the premise... It's one of those ideas that only could have worked in the 40s, but it's one of those things that, I don't know, it looks like it might be worth at least one watch for the cast and for the premise. I don't have a whole lot of hope in terms of it being a genuine gem or a diamond in the rough, but that's why I, I like to watch movies like this and find films like Chicago Joe and the Showgirl because... These are the movies that are rarely talked about. These are the films that have fallen in between the cracks. And sometimes those are the most special films because they're, they're the ones that can, at times, truly shine and uh, be just as bright as any of the other bigger, more well-known movies. And when you find something like that that's hidden there is something to be said about it and it's a little more special at least to me so I'll, I'll give this a watch one of these days just because it might be one of those films uh so yeah chicago joe and the showgirl the next one is child's play 2 classic excellent sequel uh one of the best slasher films from the 1990s and uh, the last great child's play film i like child's play 3 i think it's a little underrated but it's not on the same level as the first two in terms of quality this one i think is on the same level as the first i really like child's play 2 it's got good kills good performances by the cast Yes, the way that it handles uh, some of the characters from the first movie in particularly uh, in particular if I can speak, sorry. The mother and uh, Chris Sarandon's character. That could have been handled better. But that doesn't hurt my enjoyment of the film that much. Alex Vincent is still really good here. Of course, Brad Dourif is the voice of Chucky. We have some newcomers here who really hold their own. In Christina Lee, Jenny Agutter, Garrett Graham. And... Uh, the puppet work by Kevin Yeager is taken to a whole other level of quality and effectiveness. And uh, I love the final showdown in the Toy Factory. It's one of my favorite sequences in the entire franchise. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a really big fan of Child's Play 2. I, I, 
I would love to see this get a collector's edition from Screen Factory, as well as the third film. Uh, I like it so much, uh, let's go four and a half stars. I, I, I really enjoy Child's Play 2. The next one here is uh, Class of 1999. And uh, this is one that is, a, I think, I don't know if it's actually a sequel to Class of 1984. I've heard some ideas that it is, but then I've heard some things that it's not, and it's just its own film. It's a film that does have a Blu-ray from Vestron Collector Series, and I do have it. I actually haven't seen it, though. I know it deals with Android teachers, and you got Bradley Gregg from Nightmare 4, and actually Nightmare 3, if I remember correctly. Um, and you have Tracy Lind from Fright Night Part 2, Malcolm McDowell, Stacey Keach, Patrick Kilpatrick, the Sandman from Death Warrant, Pam Greer, John P. Ryan, the American cyborg himself. Uh, and uh, I've heard a lot of crazy things. Like it has a really insane climax with a lot of inventive weaponry. So it's one of those films that I, I definitely am looking forward to checking out one of these days. And Marco Lester is a very capable director. So yeah, it lo looks like it might be a fun little film. So class of 1999. Then we have Come See the Paradise, directed by Alan Parker. I know about this film because it stars Dennis Quaid. And I'm a huge Dennis Quaid fan. And I've seen the trailer for it. It looks, looks like a different kind of period piece. Because it's controversial. It deals with a period in American history that... A lot of films don't really cover. And uh, I think as a result, it has a lot of potential to be a really compelling drama and really stand out and be a different kind of film than some of the other period pieces that take place during World War II. Because it deals with this American, this guy, Jack, played by Dennis Quaid, who falls in love with... Uh, this Japanese American woman, Lily, played by Tamil and Tomita, and this all happens, this this uh, romance amid the backdrop of World War II and the Japanese and bomb Pearl Harbor, and then the Japanese Americans are then interned in these concentration camps in America in what they thought was their country and to deal with that plus this romance which would have been considered at the time to be very taboo and forbidden but even more so once you have World War II and all that strife and all that inner drama I think it could be a really compelling film and Dennis Quaid is a phenomenal actor so I, I have been really curious about this film for many, many years. And uh, if I ever do get around to doing a Dennis Quaid marathon, this is one of those films that uh, I will definitely be watching. But I can't really say that much about it. Other than I'm curious about the film because I haven't gotten around to seeing it yet. So yeah, a uh, different kind of love story. Come see the paradise. Then we have Coup de Ville or Coup de Ville. Directed by Joe Roth. I've heard about this one. Another one I've seen the trailer for. I've heard some good things about it. A uh, fun coming of age movie. In the vein of Stand By Me. And other films like that. With a group of guys. Who decide. To. Go on a road trip. I think they were brothers. So these brothers go on this road trip. And. It's this period of bonding for them all and it stars Patrick Dempsey, Ari Gross, Daniel Stern. You also have Annabeth Gish, Alan Arkin, uh, Joseph Bologna and uh, it's one of those coming of age films. Like I said, it's a coming of age movie that is a homage and a tribute to the 60s and uh yeah, it's one of those films that looks like it could be fun. 
could be a fun slice of life from a particular time period that uh, is now long past, but I can't say uh, that much more about it because I haven't seen it yet. So that's uh, Coup de Ville or Coupe de Ville. The next one is Courage Mountain, directed by Christopher Ledditch. And this is like a version of Heidi, starring Charlie Sheen. I mean, I, it beats me too. I mean, like, really? Heidi with Charlie Sheen? Uh, they have a Swiss girl. She's sent off to boarding school at the beginning of World War One. I. I think it's Juliet Caton who plays the Heidi character in this. You also have Jan Rubes, who's been in other things. And Leslie Caron. But uh, Charlie Sheen in Heidi... But they didn't want to call it Heidi, so they just called it Courage Mountain. Uh, this It just looks very corny from the poster. Uh, I also think this might have been one of those films that was held back from release. Like, Charlie did it, like, long before 1990 because he needed the money. But then it ultimately got, sh it ultimately got shelved. And then it was released on home video or something. Uh, two years later or, or something along those lines. I'm not 100% sure though. Oh yeah, it's from the director of Teen Wolf 2. I knew I recognized that director's name. Christopher Ledditch. So yeah, Courage Mountain. Their climb to freedom will become their greatest adventure. Yeah, sure. Then uh, we have... I'm going to open up uh, some more here. Next up is Crash and Burn, directed by Charles Band. This is another one of those robot films that Charles Band loved to do for Full Moon. This is kind of a sequel to Robot Jocks. Like, it takes place, I think, in the same universe. But there's none of the same characters. I, it's one of those kind of movies. Uh, it stars Paul Gannis, uh, Megan Ward... Bill Mosley's in it. I haven't gotten around to seeing this one yet either. I remember the trailer. There's this uh, robot, which I think might be played by Bill Mosley, who's like the Terminator. And there's another big giant robot, like the one in Robot Jocks. It might not actually have anything to do with Robot Jocks. That might just be trying to fill in the blanks. But uh, I do remember the trailer. It looked like it might be a time waster. And I also remember when I got the DVD that was a part of this multi-pack, which had Murder Cycle and I think Robot Wars in it. Or was it Robo Warriors? I, I, I think it was just Robot Wars. I remember the, the aspect ratio was awful. One of the worst I'd ever seen for a DVD. So... Yeah, I was really disappointed by that. But thankfully... Shadow Factory did a release that had a double feature of this film and Robot Wars. And the picture quality and the aspect ratio was much better. So if you are curious about seeing this one and you want to get a DVD of it. Because you want, it for, want a copy of it for your collection. Avoid the full moon release. Go with the Shout Factory double feature. So that's Crash and Burn. Then you have a film called Crazy People, which is directed by Tony Bill and Larry and Barry L. Young. And this features Dudley Moore and Daryl Hannah. Paul, Paul Reiser is also in it. J.T. Walsh, David Paymer, Mercedes, Mercedes Rule. You have uh, an ad executive who snaps, has a mental break. He winds up in a mental institution. And then I guess he gets help with his ad campaigns from crazy people. I think he falls in love with Daryl Hannah. I haven't seen the film, but I've definitely heard of it. But I haven't actually had the, the chance to see the movie. I know it was a pretty big bomb and it didn't do that well. And uh, this was the start of 
a serious decline when it comes to Dudley Moore and uh, his success on film. And uh, it's too bad because he's a very talented guy. And uh, But it just seems like one of those things where I don't really feel like he chose the right films. Like he really should have hired a better agent or something. Uh, a lot of this, I think, could have been avoided if he just had better selection of movies. So, yeah, that's crazy, people. The next one is Criminal Justice. It's a drama featuring Forrest Whitaker, Anthony LaPaglia, Rosie Perez, Jennifer Grey, Tony Todd. And uh, directed by Andy Wolk. You have a victim who has to identify her assailant. And uh, there's this whole, it's a courtroom drama. And apparently it got a lot of good reviews. I've never seen it though. Uh, then again, I'm not super big on courtroom dramas for the most part. A lot of courtroom dramas feel like if you've seen one, you've seen them all. But uh, I might give us a watch one of these days for, for the cast. Um, so that's Criminal Justice. Then we have Cry Baby, which is a John Waters film that I actually haven't seen. I've seen a lot of his other movies, but I haven't seen this one yet. It's another, honestly, it's kind of another coming of age movie, but this time it takes place in, I believe, the 50s. And Johnny Depp is in it. You have Amy Locaine, Susan Tyrell, Iggy Pop, Ricky Lake, Tracy Lords, uh, Joe De D'Alessandro, Troy Donahue. And it deals with this girl who is super proper and well-to-do and put together. But then she becomes more of a renegade and because she falls for this motorcycle riding juvenile delinquent played by Johnny Depp. I think it's like a comedy, but it's also kind of a rom-com. I haven't had the opportunity to see this one, but it looked like it might be all right from what I've seen in terms of the trailers, but it's definitely one of the most mainstream films that John Waters did. I think this was one of the movies that he tried to do to show that he could do more subdued and not as crazy gonzo films as uh, he was known for, but ultimately I don't think it did that well, so he kind of went back to the same well that he was familiar with after this movie. Uh, but yeah. That's Cry Baby. Directed by John Waters. Then we have Cyrano de Bergiac. Directed by Jean-Paul Rapineau. Starring Gerard Depardieu. Uh, Depard Vincent Perez is also in it. I wanted to point this out. Because this poster makes it look like it's an action adventure. And it is not. Cyrano de Bergiac is not an action adventure. By any means. I don't think I've seen... Actually, I think I did. I saw this in a history class. I think I saw this in either a history class or a literature class years ago. And I don't remember much about it, except I thought it was boring. So, yeah, that's uh, Cyrano de Bergiac, the guy with the big nose. You know what? I think if I want to see a movie about a guy with a big nose, that's essentially this story. I'll stick with Roxanne with Steve Martin. So, yeah, um, the rest of these are from the letter D, and I think I'll save them for later.